to News from Underground, the best show on the internet for everything anarchy. And today we have some special announcement we want to, I guess, go into really quickly is that this Sunday we have accounts episodes. So if you're here in Richmond or you want to see what the anarchist viewpoint or <laughs> is on Star Wars, uh, I think there's a lot up in that area we can kind of dissect uh, Sith Lords versus Jedi's uh, or Jedi's, uh, you know, protectors of like, you know, the Republic, right? So another government themselves, right? Separating your emotions from, from everything else, very Spock like. Um, so we're going to do that this Sunday at noon. So if you guys want to be part of the conversation, come here to the Satoshi Anarchy Garden and discuss. <laughs> it's a laid back chill uh, environment and not much that requires a lot of studying. Um, of course, we're going to go watch uh, Star Wars later today at a uh, bow tie after sushi night. So if you guys want to catch up with that, you know, go for it. And so with that, I guess, yeah, see you this Sunday, hopefully, and uh, more information is in the description. So we're seeing raw milk in the news again. Over the past few years, we've seen numerous accounts of small farmers um, being falling victim to government thuggery. Uh, the debates rage over whether or not raw milk is safe. Some argue that it has a superior nutritional profile, um, showing how it, it, uh, it doesn't spoil like regular milk does. If you leave it out on the counter, it has even uh, additional health benefits if you're familiar with whey protein. Um, we're seeing Fort Worth jury convicts small family farm after raw milk found at food co-op. A Fort Worth jury found raw milk farmer Eldon Hooley guilty Tuesday evening of allegedly running a food establishment unapproved source, which carries a fine of $1,500. Last Monday, the city dropped three of the four charges and decided to take the food establishment unapproved source to trial, for which they ultimately successfully swayed the jury who chose to not exercise their right to nullify unjust laws. Judge Andrew T. Bradshaw let this happen. That's some crazy stuff. Right, so they uh, initially came into charges for uh, their milk testing positive for a bacteria. Um, so no one fell victim to any illness because of this bacteria, but because of Texas um, law, they just so happened to be charged. They're under the suspicion, right? That's, that's all it requires to, to violate your consent. Under the suspicion. So, so here's, um, here's my question. I, I read that they're actually outside the, the city limits, mm -hmm. and actually pretty far outside of the city, city limits. How are they actually convicted in Fort Worth uh, under the municipal system? So they're being charged um, for selling the milk product in the city limits, but okay. what they were actually doing was selling their milk on the farm and allowing a food co-op to uh, use their van for transportation. Mm. Um, so that's actually where they're getting this um, charge of a food establishment unapproved source. They're actually saying that the van, since they didn't have the proper um, licenses, licenses and permits, thank you, right. Um, so that's why they're coming in charges. That is ridiculous. Yeah, if they want to, if if they want to get you, they'll find a way to get you. It's, it's like the, uh, what, three felonies a day issue? Right. Everybody commits three felonies a day, at the very least just uh, doing their financial transactions. I do my best to purposely break uh, at least two, three dozen laws a day. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, somebody asked to. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was looking, uh, reading that over, and yeah, there, there's no one that was sick from, from any of this stuff. It's just uh, an mm -hmm. assumption. And, you know, I guess these kind of drive for good nutritional healthy food, like from Joe Salatin's farm, is something that the FDA or S uh, USDA kind of abhors, right? Because they have their corporate interests, their factory farming ones uh, that pay out a lot to these kind of political goonies. And so if you want to eliminate comp competition to that, you want to eliminate these small farms that are trying to do something different, uh, something outside of uh, the corporate norm. And you find all these kind of regulations and laws on, on people like this. Raw, raw milk from milk. Uh, they'll threaten your life. Right. It's becoming easier and easier to commit crimes. Um, apparently the defendant's lawyer got a witness for the prosecution to admit that uh, someone bringing lettuce from their garden to a neighbor would also fall into uh, the qualification for operating a food establishment and you could be charged. <laughs> it's, it's, probably, it's, just, it's probably just so broad, so <laughs> broadly written that they can classify anything. It has to be broadly written. Yeah. yeah, it has to be very vague so they can compass and throw a wide net onto all the other tax collectors and grab them whenever they feel and want, want to. Uh, laws are purposely done that way. Uh, everything can never be defined objectively or measured in such a way. 
That way, at least for broad interpretation, if they feel like they don't like you, then they can interpret it in a different way. Um, yeah, this wasn't supposed to happen. It was, it was supposed to be, you know, this wonderful country where laws were never broad, and they were always very specific, and you always knew when you were breaking the laws. But uh, that kind of goes to show how much of a fairy tale constitutionalism is. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're from Richmond and you want to get some raw milk, there's a place at uh, Bird Park. There's a farmer's market every Tuesday there from, I guess, winter times. They're open every Tuesday throughout the entire year. You can get some raw milk there. Now, I get some myself. It's, it's awesome. It's great. Generally, any other container of milk is you're just really drinking cow pus. Does that, does that sound appetizing? Um, they, also have, uh, they also have grass-fed beef yeah. and butter, cheese, uh, other products like that. And I've never seen any taxes there, right? When I talk about support local agris businesses, that's a great place to start. Um, there's a lot of great food that you can get there. Uh, uh, but yeah, this, this yeah, issues like this are some of the things that first woke me up. If you ever look into this issue, um, the benefits of raw milk versus pasteurized milk, um, it's incredible the things they uh, find to pick on. Right. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting in the, in the article you mentioned, it's like that uh, they chose not to exercise their right to nullify unjust laws. Um, I don't know if it meant that they chose as if they were aware that they could do that. Uh, well, I think it was. I think it was just the uh, just a artifact of the article, right? Right, right, uh, right, 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 right. Because right. where the article came from, uh, right. I, I suspect. I strongly suspect they just didn't know. They just didn't know, yeah. right? That being it, the case, that's generally what happens, right? Uh, I remember coming across another story in Pennsylvania of a family that was free from such prosecution because the jury chose to uh, nullify those laws. Uh, so it's interesting here you have another case of the opposite going on. And of course, uh, the, the defendant's lawyer cannot talk about jury nullification. Uh, it's, it's criminal for him to even mention to the uh, jurors that, look, you guys can follow your own conscience. <laughs> uh, disregard whatever the judge is going to tell you. It's nothing but lies and bullshit anyways. Forget the facts. There's, there, there's no victim. There's no crime. And, but they're not allowed to say that. And the judge, of course, is going to lie to them and say, no, you have to follow uh, the rules. Whereas, no, you know, whatever the jury comes out of uh, that room with, with whatever verdict, that's, that's what goes. Right? And the judge cannot overturn that and cannot charge the defendant for double jeopardy for the same crime. Um, and this, um, looking at this from an activist point of view, this is actually a, a good argument for uh, really establishing uh, roots in your community, really building up um, the community around you, because this, this type of stuff we can prevent from happening. And this is proven in situations like Biscuit Gate. So um, Biscuit Gate was a, was a case of a, a baker that was uh, selling goods out of, out of her house. Mm -hmm. And she was making, you know, she was making quite a, you know, uh, quite a stamp in the community. People really liked them, but she got pulled into this, this, uh, into this system, and they, and they tried to litigate against her. But people just really became outraged, and and they they really made that outrage felt in the government, and they ended up being being able to walk free. They were facing jail time. Nice. They were really, yeah, really in trouble, but they got the community to 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 fight for them, and they did. And they came out ahead. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what's kind of important. Is you need uh, people to advocate for you. Yeah. It's very easy for government to pick you apart when there's no one <laughs> around to help you out or, or kind of mum to the word. Um, you know, if you're here in Richmond and you have any of these problems, let us know. Give us a call. Um, we'll go out there and advocate for you. Um, that's the only way to help end <laughs> this war on people. Uh, jury notification is it's an interesting tool to use and wield. Uh, the next story we have is humans are slamming into driverless cars, exposing key flaws. The self-driving car, the cutting its creation that's supposed to lead to a world without accidents, it's achieving the exact opposite right now. The vehicles have racked up crash rate double, crash rate double that of human drivers. The glitch, they obey the law all the time, as in without exception. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, for example, you have an argument that some of the programmers uh, from like Google Inc. and Carnegie uh, Mellon University are heating up and they're talking about. So they then teach cars how to commit infractions from time to time to stay out of trouble. So like the problem is that they are, you know, driving the speed limit. They are, you know, obeying every traffic law and whatnot and staying in their lanes. You know, they're not aggressive or um, 
using common sense, right? It's like, well, there's no one in front of me. I can speed up, you know, five to 10 miles per hour, you know, and, or uh, inch a little closer and have, I guess, real human understanding of the environment around you while you're driving. This really puts, um, this really puts a context to the morality versus obedience argument because this is really a situation where you have morality conflicting with obedience at a raw programming standpoint. So when you have cars following laws that you know do not account for every situation, they can't. Right. Um, and it may actually be unethical in certain situations. They follow the law. And people get hurt because of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think it's much of Googling driverless cars that are at fault here. It's the, Absolutely not. <laughs> it's the state's it's the state roads, right? Yeah. It's the state infrastructure. I can't see why anybody would argue that this is Google's, that, that right. this is the car's fault. Right. Uh, traffic uh, death toll for on government ro- roads are about 38,000 people died on government roads, mm-hmm. right? Uh, they should be held liable for that. Those are their roads. It's like if you're on a, on a, on a train and there was an accident, and they'd be held liable for that, that, that accident or your injuries. Or any other area that's supposed to kind of safely guide your transportation to and from. Um, so that's that's government roads. Thirty eight thousand people uh, died on these uh, red line traffic accidents. The uh, as Ben was saying, uh, that, yeah, this kind of exposes the the flaws in the government's code and that they can't uh, relate to real life human uh, interactions. Well, of course, I mean, most of the traffic codes aren't even for. Uh for protection anyway. I mean, right. they really are uh, revenue generating schemes. Um, and this is evidence because like there have actually been studies done with speed limits and speed limits are generally marked lower than the actual safe speed. And when this is done, it's been proven that it actually causes more uh, traffic accidents. Right. So you have these governments, these local and county governments and state governments marking these speed limits purposely too low and purposely causing you know more destruction on the highways so they can make an extra buck right because people in general the vast majority of people drive the the speed that they feel safer driving and what that means is that people get pulled over for speeding and people have to pay right yeah, it's, uh, it's under, all an extortion scheme. It has nothing to do with your safety. Uh, if it did, they'd follow suits what uh, <laughs> this traffic engineer, Hans uh, Monderman, developed this really cr- awesome uh, shared road experiences from the Netherlands. And it's, this idea has taken off in a lot of cities in Europe in which they've removed all the traffic lights. They've also removed all the stop signs, all, the, all that stuff. You know, there's just your right away stuff, right? But the sidewalks are removed too, and everyone can use the road. People can walk, bicycle, and, and drive. And what it ended up occurring was the accident rates dropped down dramatically. Uh, the congestion of traffic dropped down dramatically. Uh, if people are able to get to work faster, you know, there's less prone of, uh, of injury going on. Because what ended up happening is that when you have these government, uh, I guess, wrong code that they put up there, you pay attention to the lights, you pay attention to the signs, you don't pay attention to anyone else around you. So it's a different area of focus, right? You see the lights, I gotta hurry up and go fast. Uh, I have a right of way, so I'm not going to worry what's going up, you know, to my right. If they have a stop sign, I just, I just zoom, right? Orange light means go faster. And, <laughs> and, and that's, that's why you have a lot of these uh, accidents and congestion. Um, there's like, there's a video of this one woman in England who was kind of very hypocritical. Like, no, this can never work here. And then the next day they did an interview. It was like, I got home like 20 minutes faster. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the wonder is when you remove government centralized control over human movement. Well, a lot of uh, a lot of the streetlights are actually un- unnecessary queuing, and unnecessary queuing necessarily has to result in more um, congestion. Right. So a lot of times you end up with the you know with the situation where where you have um, these these cross lights congested only because they are stopped by these these stoplights. So you have situations where like it's a certain time of day and nobody needs to turn left or nobody needs to turn right or whatever, but you still have to wait for the left turn. Right. And it just adds unnecessary space to this, this situation where people are in a rush to get to work or get home. Right. 
They, uh, so, you know, could driverless cars help lay to like an end to the police extortionist uh, attempts? Or like, I look at them as um, not road pirates, but like spiders out there on the highways and they have their spider traps and just getting their victim in really quickly and then extorting them, right? And robbing them of their property. Um, so with driverless cars, I've seen that seems to be a lot of contention, I'd imagine, for police extortionists because the bulk of their arrests and stuff like that come from that, right? It's like, well, you know, your tail light is out. It's like, oh, you know, it's expired. Don't we write to, what you got in your car? Oh, okay, great. Here's a bus now. Great. I did a good job. Uh, we don't see them forfeiting their arms, so they'll just find new ways to harass Right, 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 right. right. Well, I suspect it's, it, it's going to be, an, it'll probably be similar to taxi versus Uber. Right. The taxi unions hate Uber. The police unions will hate driverless cars because they're not making us, making enough money. They're not making their quotas, right. which, despite what they would like to tell you, do exist. They do exist. They're not yeah. consumer driven. They're not uh, run by efficiency of like, yeah, five star rating. Oh, they did a great job. Uh, they're not run by the number of subscription rates to their service. And so they, they can't measure that, uh, their, their measure of success. The only way they do that is by the number of times you uh, kidnap someone or handed out extortion fines to. Uh, so like there's a, an, an incident occurred in Mountain View. A police extortionist noticed that there was a traffic, you know, stacking up behind this Google driverless car going 24 miles per hour, putting back traffic apparently. And he came by the vehicle and zoomed over, you know, it was like trying to tell this vehicle to pull over, but nobody was driving. <laughs> Uh, there's a guy in the passenger seat, of course, but he's not the one who's driving. And so and he didn't know what to do and just gave him a warning, I believe. And so, but yeah, that's that's something, a new contention for police extortionists to kind of contend with and try to figure out what to do with that. And Well, this really goes to, it, this really adds to it. It's like, um, you know, who would build the roads? Well, maybe we wouldn't need roads if you just got out of the way. Right, right. Maybe we have way too many roads, right? Yeah. Roads I've never used. We do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know where I'll go with that, but it's a much better place, uh, especially with driverless cars. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Right. <laughs> uh, the next story we have. So, uh, the U.S. gas prices fall below $2, and in some places under $1.60. Christmas came early for U.S. drivers on Monday, as the national average gasoline price fell below $2 a gallon for the first time since March 2009. Unsurprisingly, drivers can credit a global glut of crude oil for the steady pressure on gas prices. So um, this has various causes behind it that, uh, that are generally recognized. One of them is the, uh, the boom from the Bakken oil fields up north in uh, North Dakota. And I think it actually, um, uh, I, I believe they go into Canada a little bit, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, also the explosion of fracking. I shouldn't use that term, but the expansion of the fracking business mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> uh, have contributed to uh, to lower gas prices, and uh, because it's more supply, you know, and um, also OPEC has been oversupplying recently. So they've been, I think, over oversupplying by uh, I didn't write it down, but I think it was twenty percent or so. And uh, a lot of the speculation behind that, this is that they're doing this on purpose to try to cripple the, um, the Western gas suppliers, hmm. or uh, I'm sorry, oil suppliers. So uh, like the Bakken, the Bakken fields kind of threw them for a loop. And uh, I think uh, the idea is that, the, that OPEC is trying to sort of um, drive them, drive the Bakken, the Bakken boom out of business because uh, with lower prices, the Bakken oil fields aren't really going to be feasible for uh, for oil extraction, right? So this is actually really hurting the Bakken oil fields, hmm. uh, according to a lot of news sources. You guys ever come across the argument of like the like there's an emergency and uh, people selling like high price generators, and they're saying, well, that's that's an evil thing for you to do to kind of up the prices for these generators or same thing I've heard with gasoline prices or whatnot. Um, you guys ever come across that? People kind yeah, of sure. Yeah. What, what, oh, yeah. Uh, what do you, yeah, what do you respond sure. to that? Uh, well, I, I actually lived in Florida in um, during Hurricane Andrew, and it was in, and during a whole bunch of other hurricanes. But uh, and it, a lot of that was was happening. People were gouging people for for generators and stuff. 
And um, it's, you know, yeah, it seems like kind of a dick move at the time, but the fact is, if you have, that's, that's what the invisible hand is. That right. is the very definition of the invisible hand. So um, Adam Smith didn't know what the invisible hand was at the time, but it was later discovered that this is price theory, that higher prices, you know, brings more business to the area, to areas where it's required. This is why socialism doesn't work. This is why communism doesn't work because they have the calculation problem and they can't, you know, they right. can't calculate with this without this price signal. And that just just that itself tells you that price gouging is a positive thing. Exactly. And it is by by necessity a positive thing. It is nece necessary to bring more uh, more resources to that area because they know it's profitable. They know that's a good area to take it. So scalpers will scalpers will will chase that arbitrage opportunity. Right. And they will go there, and the price will go down. And people that are already yeah, in the very beginning, it may seem very high. Um, people start profiting. The people who are in much greater demand of that will be the ones who have that, uh, I guess, uh, property available to them. But as the more and more other people start coming in, that those prices do tend to drop. Um, you know, I don't think why people should be upset that the fact they're actually bringing these products <laughs> in, the, in the neighborhood. And if you're really that hurt for uh, electricity or these generators and make good friends with your neighbors who manage to get one, right? Don't be an asshole, <laughs> right? Uh, I think there's a lot of other things, factors that people don't take into that context. Um, well, there's a whole lot of, well, you know, rich people are nasty, evil people. But, well, you know, maybe if you have a rich friend who is willing to pay this extra money for a scalped generator, maybe you're not going to be cold tonight. Right, yeah. I mean, <laughs> maybe if you didn't treat the rich person like crap just because he has more money than you right you know maybe you'd have a good night no i was i was like looking for some good feel stories and came across uh like i guess a section on the internet where people just plaster all these all these great uh good feel stories but all of them deal with people donating money to people all of them it's like endless lists endless articles of this like even one week there's like 50 of them of all these people just donating money giving money with uh, philanthropy uh, helping people out, leaving behind like thousands of dollars on, on a tip. This happens all the time. And I was like, I've never come across so much in like in, in just a one week period of people just help, trying to help uh, other people out. Um, of course, that's underreported. That's not mm -hmm. the news. Um, that doesn't happen. People are not, uh, you know, um, helpful towards other neighbors. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's been shown time and time again that um, the more wealthy actually tend to be more generous. And you know nobody, nobody cares. It's it's really politics of envy. Nobody yeah. likes rich people, and it's it's purely envy. It is. It is. Um, probably a projection of uh, maybe <laughs> the lack of a nest egg that their own parents set up for them. Yeah. Right. Uh, they think we were talking about a little bit about this the other day, and about people trying to trying to say, well, you know, you grew up in a rich family. You're like. Like, uh, like your, your coddle or your caterer is like, no, I mean, my parents cared about me. I mean, it's great that they uh, amass a lot of resources. You know, birds do this, animals do this before the, their young come out, you know, get resources and, and then able to sustain the, you know, the young until they're into adulthood. Parents would be doing the same thing, right? Amassing resources, building up their nest egg, so then the child doesn't have to, uh, you know, have to eat cans of ravioli all the time, for example, right? Well, here you go, treat them like dog food. You know, that's, at least that's what the state requires, you know, to house them, put some dog food in their bowl, uh, treat them as you would any other animal, right? Uh, I saw this little meme once of a, a, a child. The meme is saying, uh, you know, be grateful for what you have. Don't question, you know, your, your upbringings or your parents. And he's wearing one shoe from his father, the other shoe from his mother. And, and, and that's the meme, right? And then they look kind of ragged and stuff like that. Like, look, don't bring me into this world. You can't provide me shoes. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's, that's not, that's not the, the kind of environment you want to raise a, a child in. And so, yeah, I, I think it's great that, I guess in that regards, that there's a lot of parents who do take that in consideration to mind before they have uh, children to actually prepare for that. Yeah, I think a lot of it is, is kind of cultural programming. Um, when I was younger and in grade school, I actually, there were, it, it became almost a competition in, in the area that, um, that I was hanging out with. It became almost a competition to have a worse life as a child. And you, you almost got the sense that you were inferior 
if you did, if you had, you know, a decent, you know, resources provided for you, mm-hmm. or if you had, you know, if you didn't get in violent situations with your parents, you know, stuff like that. It's it it almost became, and it, I think part partly it's it's social programming, and partly it's it's parents that don't want to, you know, that program their children that don't want to admit that they're crappy parents. And in right. in part, it's it's the underdog, you know, the love for the underdog, but um, it's there is a, a a pretty big culture like this, you know, in America. Oh, well, it's subsidized by the government as well, right? Oh yeah. Uh, so you get more money if you have more kids by the government, and uh, kind of keep you indebted and dependent on on the system. The last thing they want you to be is independent. So I'll ask uh, ask both of you. So. A lot of panic is going around about uh, about this the oil prices and that this is a a market failure and an argument against freedom because OPEC is after all a cartel and OPEC is driving this this uh, price situation. Uh, that this is an argument against a free market. Yeah. All right. There's no free market out there. All right. <laughs> That's an easy one, right? Uh, is there a respect for private property? Right. Mm-hmm. If the answer is no, it's not a free market. Is there respect for voluntary exchange? If the answer is uh, no, then yeah, there is no free market. It's a state-controlled market. Uh, same thing with uh, these. Anything that has association after the name is is a government-granted cartel, like the Veterinarian Association, uh, the Taxi Cab Association, the American Psychological uh, Psychology, Psychiatry uh, Association. All of these are just cartels to kind of monopolize those areas and fields and prevent anyone from. Um, from competing, uh, they they limit and they confine. But yeah, same thing with OPEC. Same thing. Uh, government granted cartels and monopolies. Um, nothing to do with the free market. Nothing there to do with respect to private property. Can anyone compete? They'll be shot if they try to. Right. What do you think? I absolutely agree. There's not much else to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was certainly a softball. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 But that, that is an argument that people are putting forth. And, yeah. yeah and, and that's that's when you kind of have to. Uh, Obviously, they're not being given a good definition of what a free market is. Right. Right. And that's where we have to kind of come in and help define those terms. Uh, same thing with capitalism. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> those are good stories, guys. Uh, so I guess we'll, we'll wrap up. If you guys enjoyed this video, um, you can show your, <laughs> your love for this video or, or what we do by liking and sharing, right? Or send this to your friends and help them to subscribe as well. And with that, you know, if you guys are free this Sunday, come by, join us for our couch episode. We're going to talk about everything Star Wars. Starts at noon. And see you guys at the Victory Party. I'm Cal Maloney. Isaac Markson. And I'm Phil, the anarchistician. Take good care, guys.